Mhm. Mm okay. 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 No, it's Mehdi who's muted, yeah. Okay, shall yes, I start? Yes, yes, Professor Neumayer, we could see you and we could see PowerPoint. If you like, you could uh, start it. Okay, well, the title of my talk is American Linguistic and European Linguistics, An Uneasy History, uh, tracing some of the controversies between the Americans and the Europeans from the 1930s. Now, I can't, I have to ask you now, I'll try share screen one more time, but I can't, it won't let me. Um, so I need my next slide then. Can you give me the next slide? I get on. Um, Um, I'm not sure what's happening. What do you because, see? Let me try. Sh um, maybe if you stop share screen, I'll try one more time. Um, You know, it's the same problem. Um, it won't let me share my screen. It says because of security and privacy, open system preferences on my Mac, and um, nothing happens. So we're going to have to have you change the slides. Reporting in progress. Um, but the background now we are we could see background oh slide. okay yeah right that that's my second slide exactly okay. okay all right so um i'll go on then um linguistics in some ways is still a very immature field we talk about american linguistics french linguistics danish linguistics etc but from the 1930s through the 1970s American linguistics stood out as particularly distinctive, first because of the variety of structuralism practiced, and then because of early generative grammar. And now, next, please. Next slide. Um, American linguistics was so different that it's reasonable to contrast American linguistics with the generic European linguistics. I'll do that next minute. Um, so this talk will focus on the interplay between the two approaches. At first, there was mutual hostility between the Americans and the Europeans. But as time went on, the Americans became more and more indebted to the Europeans. The roots of American linguistics are very firmly in Europe. The Linguistic Society of America, or the LSA, was founded in 1924. Of the first 12 LSA presidents, nine had been born in Europe or had studied there. Um, and here are the big three of American linguistics from the 1920s and 1930s. Franz Boas, the oldest, who was born in Germany, Edward Sapir, his student, who was born in Germany, and their colleague, Leonard Bloomfield, who was born in the United States, but studied in Germany. Under Bloomfield's leadership, American structural linguistics developed in a thoroughly positivistic direction between the 1930s and the 1950s. Bloomfield himself said, the only useful generalizations about language are inductive generalizations, by which he, he meant that if you can't record it, um, if you can't turn it into facts or statistics, it's not even worth talking about. So what about meaning? Well, meaning is hard or impossible to measure. So the American structuralists wanted meaning to play no role in grammatical analysis. Um, 
For the most positivist linguists, the idea was to arrive at a grammar of a language by performing a set of operations on a corpus of data, each successive operation being one step farther removed from the corpus. So you had to do everything in principle in this order. First, you find the sounds. Then once you found the sounds of a language, then you find the phonemes, then you find the morphemes, then you find the syntax, then you find the discourse patterns. It had to work in that order. Uh, as Charles Hockett, one of the leading students of Bloomfield wrote, there is no circularity, no grammatical fact of any kind is used in making phonological analysis. Not surprisingly, American structuralists shunned constructs that were being developed at the same time in Europe. European linguists in the 1930s were talking about language universals, markedness, binaries, distinctive features, and above all, theories of semantics and how meaning might relate to grammar. Um, to, what, to many American linguists, what the Europeans were doing bordered on mysticism. And here's a quote from Henry A. Gleason, who wrote my textbook when I was a student, quote, the popular wisdom among Americans was that some European linguists sat around in their offices and dreamed up theory, often detached from reality of any kind. More examples. Joseph Greenberg, who is very well known for his work in typology, uh, wrote, to a neophyte like me, American structural linguistics, with its claims to rigorous scientific methodology and definitions of basic units of language without recourse to meaning, was naturally enough enormously impressive. In contrast, Prague linguistics, and the Prague school, of course, was the best known most active school of structural linguistics in the Europe in Europe in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, in contrast, Prague linguistics seemed impressionistic and lacking in scientific rigor. Uh, the worst of all, George Traeger, reviewing a book from a European linguist. This book exhibits the usual kind of European philosophizing on the basis of insufficient evidence. So these are typical attitudes of American linguistics from the 1930s and 40s. Uh, one more sign of changing times. In 1936, five of the seven LSA executive committee members had been born in Europe and five had studied there. Uh, there were eight members of the executive committee in 1946. Not one was either born in Europe or had studied there. So Americans developed their own kind of linguistics. The Europeans replied in the same spirit of hostility. They frequently dismissed the purely formal distribution-based approach of the Americans as play acting at science. They simply could not believe that one could do linguistics without paying attention to meaning. Um, I couldn't find a picture of Maurice Lacroix but he was a Belgian, I believe, historian of linguistics. And he wrote this book on the history of linguistics, I think in the 1950s. And he wrote, the analytic method of the Americans is a logical mathematical construction lacking firm foundation. They deliberately restrict their research to questions of distribution, thereby eliminating the meanings of words from his analysis. One wonders what happens with this purely mechanical procedure when the criterion of distribution is considered to be the only relevant one to the expressive, stylistic, and other variants that are of prime importance in communication among human beings. Well, it's a typical European criticism. The Americans would have said, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in constructing grammars the formal aspects of language. We don't think that expressive, stylistic, and other variants are unimportant. That's just not what we as linguists do. 
The Second World War, okay, a human disaster. Furthermore, it was a disaster for the world of scholarship. Many universities were closed around the world, and many scholars, linguists included, were forced to become refugees. It was just the opposite in the United States. According to Martin Jose, another linguist very famous in this period, in the hothouse atmosphere of the wartime work, American linguistics, American linguistic theory was to develop far more swiftly than it had before. The cream of American structural linguistics was housed in one building, 165 Broadway in New York City during the war. I uh, found an old, very fuzzy picture of 165 Broadway, but virtually every linguist in the United States spent four years in that building during the war. Uh, Charles Hockett again, I was like a war millionaire. While many young people were fighting and dying, I was living in comfort and making not a lot of money, but a lot of intellectual progress, which people like us are inclined to consider even more important. What was going on? In 1939, Mortimer Graves, the director of a major funding organization, reasoned that if American linguists could analyze unwritten Amerindian languages, they could do the same for the, for the strategic languages for the American armed forces. In 1941, with $100,000 from the Rockefeller Foundation, and that was an enormous amount of money for academics to receive in 1941, um, was born the Intensive Language Program with J. Milton Cowan, who was Secretary Treasurer of the LSA as director. With all this money and lots of free time, the linguists involved were able to devote many hours to pure linguistics. By the end of the war, the intensive language program had produced tools for the study of dozens of languages, but the linguists involved had more than enough time for the linguistic analysis of the languages in which they specialized. According to Robert Hall, the journal Studies in Linguistics, Word, and Romance Philology resulted directly from the quickened activity of linguists during the war period. Starting in the mid-1930s, European refugee scholars began to flood into the United States. Uh, many of these, like Roman Jakobsen, were among the world's greatest linguists. I did meet Jakobsen once, just a year before he died. He was a very, very impressive man. Some American linguists like Boaz, Bloomfield, Zelig Harris, and others welcomed Jakobsen and tried to find work for him. But many, probably the majority, were hostile to the European refugees who they saw as doing the wrong kind of linguistics and is threatening to take their jobs away. Uh, Robert Hall, this is a quote that I think expresses the feelings of most American linguists in the 1940s. However, the strong anti-European feeling of many American linguistics in the 1930s and 1940s had its main roots in oftentimes bitter personal experiences. Not a few young Americans saw, and frequently more than once, positions for which they had been trained and were qualified, snatched from under their noses and given to European refugees. Such a reaction, though by no means generous, was easily understandable in the days of the Depression, when any job at all was hard to come by, and since American scholars then as now were not protected by citizenship requirements of the kind prevailing in virtually all European university systems. A frequent remark heard for many leading European American linguists was, we'll show those Europeans we have something they never dreamed of. Um, the influx of European refugee scholars 
led to the most despicable, horrible incident in American linguistic history, the so-called $2 bill conspiracy. I don't know if any of you in the, if you've been to the United States, if you've ever seen a $2 bill, they are very, very rare. And the reason it's the rare is because from the beginning, they were considered unlucky. I know it's weird, uh, but you never, almost never see $2 bills. A dozen or so prominent American structural linguists signed their names on the margin of a $2 bill, again, an unlucky bill, as a pact among them to see that Roman Jakobson be shipped back to Europe, the Europe of the death camps. This happened in 1943, which was certainly the lowest point in European-American relations in linguistics. But in, relations started to improve after the war. Um, it was the presence of European refugee linguists in the United States that poisoned the ties between European and American linguists. But ironically, it was their presence that ultimately created a sense of respect between them. As the war progressed, American linguists came to have more and more contact with their European colleagues and contact led to understanding. Refugee scholars set up the École Libre des Hautes Études in New York, um, a little bit uptown from uh, 165 Broadway. This was a makeshift university for European refugee scholars. Jakobsen taught there, as well as Ju Giuliano Bonfante, Wolf Leslau, Henri Muller, and André Spiret. By the end of the war, the two groups of linguists were attending each other's lectures. Hockett even wrote, before very long, I was attending Jakobsen's lectures at the École Libre, benefiting not from them greatly, benefiting from them greatly, and coming not just to respect but to admire the man, even when I disagreed with him. The École Libre led to the founding of the Linguistic Circle of New York, which led in turn to the founding of the journal Word. From 1947, Word was edited by the French structuralist André Martinet. Word published both American and European structuralist work, which helped greatly foster understanding between the two camps. Um, in the 1950s, positive reverence to European work by American linguists became more and more common. Um, the most vivid indicator of the cross-Atlantic rapprochement was the election of Roman Jakobson as LSA president in 1956. Himes and Fought, in their book on the history of American structuralism, go so far as to, to suggest that if a knowledgeable person were queried in the early 1950s as to who is the most prominent linguist in the United States, the answer would probably be Roman Jakobson. Um, moving on, uh, generative grammar, in 1957, the field of linguistics, at least in the United States, was shaken by the publication of Noam Chomsky's book, Syntactic Structures. Around the same time, Morris Halley's book, The Sound Pattern of Russian, had the same effect on phonology. There's a young Noam Chomsky. I think he was about 30 years old at the time, but a very old Morris Halley. I couldn't find a picture of how Halley uh, to reprint, although I did see a young picture of Halley where he looked exactly the same when he was 30 years old. Um, anyway, Chomsky and Halley. Um, early generative grammar incorporated many conceptions from European linguistics, especially the Prague School, universal phonetic and phonological elements, underlying forms, binary distinctive features, and markedness. 
And by the early 1960s, Chomsky was asserting that the problem of the correct theory of language is intimately tied to the problem of child language acquisition, just as Jakobsen had in 1941 in his Kindersprache book. One would think then that early work in generative grammar would have brought American and European linguists even closer. Unfortunately, just the opposite happened. Many European structuralists and their co-thinkers in the United States were appalled that Chomsky appeared to continue the post bloomfieldian idea that semantics is not central to grammatical theory. And semantics was not really integrated in the generative grammar until much later. André Martinet summed up the European reaction in commenting on a 1950 submission by Chomsky to the journal Word. Quote, Chomsky's submission is a reaction against the self-imposed limitations of the Bloomfieldian approach, which he liked, but one retaining all of its formalistic prejudices with, few, with a few additional ones. Actually, my impression was one of utter drabness, unrelieved by any glint indicating some hidden awareness of what a real language is. Um, this was André Martinet, uh, who was perhaps not as famous as Jakobsen, but was certainly one of the greatest European linguists of the 1950s. It wasn't until the late 1970s and the 1980s that a significant number of Europeans began working in generative grammar. Here's a partial generalization. It's not airtight, it doesn't always work. The more entrenched a homegrown structuralist theory existed in a particular country, the less success generative grammar had. And we're talking about Europe. So Denmark, the Czech, Re the Czech Republic and France, except for one or two universities, have never had a strong generative presence. Perhaps the two most generative European countries uh, are the Netherlands and Norway, where no local structuralist theory predominated. And in the United Kingdom, generative grammar flourished after the departure of Michael Halliday. Um, a very different form of European influence on American linguistics comes from the work in functionalist approaches to grammar. The Prague School notion of functional sentence perspective had a profound influence on American functionalism. Uh, early American functionalists like Dwight Bollinger, Joseph Greenberg, Wallace Chafe, and Susumu Kuno all stressed their intellectual debt to Prague. But notice now we're talking about functional linguists, not American structuralists or generative grammarians. Here's a very interesting paradox. The achievements of European generative grammar grammarians are vastly out of proportion to the number of practitioners as compared to the United States. Chomsky said to me in 1979, when I think of who around the world truly understands what I am trying to accomplish, I would have to say that all but one or two are Europeans. That's quite extraordinary, no? <laughs> um, I had a conversation with, um, next slide, please. I had a conversation with Hans Benes, uh, a Dutch language linguist much more recently. This was probably around 2005. And Benes told me, if you were to make a list of the 50 most important co contributors to generative grammar, grammar today, about 40 would be Europeans. And I think this is still true. How do we explain this paradox? Well, maybe European generative grammarians being in the minor minority had to try harder. Maybe they were far enough from MIT that MIT didn't overly influence them. 
Maybe it's the European scholarly tradition. I don't know. But it's fascinating that, I mean, it used to be that if you had a student and you wanted to send them somewhere in the world to study generative grammar, you told them to go to MIT in Cambridge. Um, you told them to go to UCLA. You told them to go to Illinois. Where do you tell them to go now? You tell them to go to Tromsø. You tell them to go to Utrecht. Um, uh, you tell them maybe to go to Pisa uh, or Siena. Uh, this has been an incredible change uh, in the last 50 years that Europe has become the real center of generative grammar and the United States has become secondary. Why this has happened, I do not know. So let me just give a short summary and conclusion. Relationships between American linguists and European linguists were often extremely difficult, though they tended to improve over time. Um, but even today, both the formal linguistics and the functional linguistics practiced in the United States shows a profound influence from work done in Europe many decades ago. Thank you, my talk. Okay, now how can we answer questions? How can this work? I'd like questions and comments, but um, I'm not sure what we do now. Yes, yes, we have uh, some questions and I'm trying to uh, stop sharing. No, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh dear. Uh, yeah. um, I am still in yes. your screen. Now, let me try screen, screen sharing one more time, but I think it's going to be the same problem. Funny thing is that you're the... the yeah, I'm, I'm having the same problem, but we, we, we can just leave things like this? Sure, yeah. yeah. It's, we can it's... see you, for some strange reason, we can see you on our computers and we can see, uh, they still see the PowerPoint on our projector. We don't, I don't understand why. This is sort of one of these mysteries that- I, I don't know either because I cannot see my PowerPoint slides. Uh, I can see you. I can yeah. see myself, I can see you, but I can't see my slides. So- Thank you so much for your perfect presentation. And we learned a lot. If uh, anyone has any question, could begin with. Can you fix the, so we can see his face? Not here. I don't know. Can you see my? Can you see me? No, but we would like to. It's easy. I can to... see. I can see. I can see myself. Oh, now we can see nothing. So you can see me. Yes, yes. We can see. Uh, you could actually go into the link. Yeah. You can. The easiest way is you just go into the link and and. In a sense, we're sitting in the same room, but each of us is staring, staring at their own computers because the projector isn't right. working anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, we, could, we could begin with Arthur if you have any questions. Well, I'm just the thing is, I mean, would you agree with that? I mean, the the idea that, uh, I mean, not only yourself, but there's quite a few other uh, linguists that come to mind when you think of uh, generativists in the United States. I mean, would you agree with the uh, idea that uh, most of the top uh, generative ling linguists today are, in fact, in uh, um, in Europe, or is that? No, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think uh, the, I mean, it's it's hard to say. And generative linguistics has changed too, of course, because it's become much more semantic, much more psychological. Uh, lots of people work on language processing. Uh, are they generative grammarians? Well, they assume generative grammar, but they're doing psycholinguistics. It's th things are not clear cut the way they used to be. But I would say that especially now Germany, uh, always the Netherlands, that's always been true. And of course, in Lund, um, Christer Platzak was... Is is he still around? Uh, he is around in a sense. He's not actually active. 
Uh, he is uh, very old, so he's. Uh, you can switch off the mic, otherwise it's. it's yeah. Anyway, yeah, Christoph so it's, Spartak, uh, and Anders Holmberg, who is from various countries, I think he started yeah. in Finland, but ended up in other places. I mean, they they laid the foundations for so many constructs that every generative grammarian assumes today. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and then, as I said, the center in Tromsø, uh, Peter Svenonius and, yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. his colleagues, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And there's very little in the United States quite like that. I mean, you can say MIT, but MIT in 2022 is not what MIT was in 1970. It's a good department, uh, but it's is it a better department than uh, Potsdam? I don't think so. No. Still your loudspeaker mic or something. Can, can I ask a question? Yes. I was wondering uh, about your view on uh, generative grammar and structuralism. Would you see generative grammar as a continuation of structuralism or as something uh, di uh, very different from structuralism? I would say, without question, generative grammar is a continuation of structuralism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, when you look at books on structuralism in general, structuralism as an intellectual movement, uh, and that includes literature and, and everything else, anthropology. Chomsky is always listed as one of the great structuralists. So mm. there's a lot of funny terminology here. Chomsky broke with structuralism in some very important ways. He rejected the structuralist phoneme for example. Um, but yes, I would say, and he, at least for the United States, removed the empiricist constraints on theory formation. But yes, Chomsky, uh, generative grammar is a development of structural linguistics. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Um, if we go to Prague School and see that, could we claim that uh, Prague School scholars were after uh, more explanation rather than description? That's why we could say that maybe they have influenced Chomsky because Chomsky approaches after, I mean, that's a kind of explanation, not just mere description. Is that uh, correct? Yes, it's absolutely correct. And there is a very clear line of transmission. Roman Jakobsen, after Trubetskoy, perhaps, the great linguist of the Prague School, who was Roman Jakobsen's greatest student, Morris Halley. Um, and Chomsky has always said his conversations with Morris Halley, uh, because Chomsky didn't learn a lot about the Prague School as a student. It's when he met Halley, Halle, Halley, um, in the 1950s that he was convinced that the Prague School was right about explanation and so on. So, I um, mean, Chomsky has never uh, denied the influence of European schools of linguistics. And what about Trobetskoy? You didn't mention him. And uh, what's, the, what's the role of Trobetskoy to this kind of contribution? Is that just well, Jakobsen or... Well, I mean, I Trubetskoy died in 1939, 1940, uh, under interrogation by the Nazis. Uh, I think Trubetskoy and Jakobsen were equal partners. Um, I think Trubets Jakobsen had more uh, influence in binary distinctive features. Trubetskoy knew more languages. Trubetskoy knew more about different kinds of phonological systems around the world. But by the 1940s, Trubetskoy was gone. And Jakobsen was really the sole uh, spokesperson for the Prague School. 
And my last question, while progress school scholars focus on uh, phonological analysis, phonological oppositions, and uh, just about phonology, more about phonology, not just, uh, while at the same time, generative linguists uh, focus on syntax. I mean that, uh, what, what's the reason that is a totally different of area? I mean that, is there any reason that Chomsky shifted to syntax rather than phonological analysis, oppositions, those issues like that? Well, first of all, in, in, in his early days, Chomsky, in fact, um, did work on phonology quite a bit. I mean, his book, Sound Pattern of English, in 1968, was co-authored with Morris Halley. But you're right, the Chomsky started on syntax in some ways earlier. And this comes out of the American structuralist tradition. Uh, American structuralists, especially Chomsky's teacher, Morris, uh, excuse me, Zelig Harris, believed that you could analyze any level of grammar by the same technique. Um, and so Harris, um, this is in the 1940s, wrote a book, Methods in Structural Linguistics, where he argued that you could find the syntax of a language the same way you could find the phonemes. And this was very, very influential on Chomsky, Chomsky never doubted that syntax was as easy or difficult to work on as phonology. And furthermore, it's in syntax where we find what for Chomsky is the most interesting fact of language, the infinitude, the fact that there's an infinite number of sentences, but only a finite number of phonemes or morphemes. And this is what led him to say, um, if there's only a finite number, if there's an infinite number of things we can say, but we have finite brains, how is the brain constructed to allow acquisition? And so I think Chomsky's taking the idea that syntax was doable from Harris led him to his psychological and cognitive claims. Is there any question in the room? I mean, that if you have any question, you could. I have a follow-up question on that. I was, I have sometimes heard that Harris would be the one who first proposed transformations or saw the problem in a more linear uh, syntactic analysis. Uh, I haven't read the Harris, so I can't, I can't say if it's true. Uh, what, what, what do you do? You know something about that? Yes, it's true. I mean, Harris okay. proposed uh, tr grammatical transformations. What Chomsky did was to transform what they mean. For Harris, a transformation was a relationship between two sentences on the surface. In other words, two actually existing sentences. Uh, actually existing sentences, you'd have an active and a passive, and we say this is the relationship between them. What Chomsky did was take transformations and make them abstract. Instead of being relations between surface sentences, they became part of a derivation that took abstract representations of sentences and transformed them ultimately into surface forms. But yes, I mean, Chomsky uh, uh, took the idea of transformations directly from his teacher, Zelig Harris. Thanks for clarifying that. Do you have any questions? I have a question, which is, it deals a little bit with the impression. I mean, I, uh, I, I have a little bit of a background in uh, generative grammar, but it's it's quite, in a sense, post Chomsky. I've got. I usually have been reading the some of the proselytes, and what I have noticed is that, whereas Chomsky himself, I mean, he, his syntactic structure that was about English. Most of what he wrote was about English or the philosophy of linguistics, and somehow applied to English. Uh, what you find today is that. Uh, many of the greatest uh, generative grammarians are, are people who are working on fairly different kinds of languages. You find people like Bobolik, you find people like Mark Baker, uh, 
mm-hmm. who are who are I mean they are generative linguists in the sense that that's their approach, but they are essentially uh, descriptive syntacticians. They look in, in very great detail. They're descriptive field workers, and um, is that I mean is that is that just coincidental that I happen to have seen that, or is it the case that generativism has left the realm of philosophy and become more concerned with details in a very diverse set of, uh, well, languages which are different from standard average European. Is that a well, it, consequence? Or? Well, I mean, it's certainly, the first part of what you said is certainly true, that uh, generative grammarians have now worked on hundreds and hundreds of different languages, some in very minute detail, like Bobolik and Baker and, and so many so many others, uh, Chomsky actually, the first language he worked on was Hebrew. Um, his master's thesis was on the morphophonemics of Hebrew, which he speaks quite fluently. Uh, but it's true. I mean, Chomsky's empirical work has mostly been on English. Whether generative grammarians have left the realm of philosophy or not, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, generative grammarians in general are less interested in broad philosophical claims, the kind that Chomsky's early books were noted for. Um, I think if you asked any generative grammarian, um, they would still say there's universal grammar. That is, we're still hardwired, our brains, for a certain type of uh, grammatical system, but you're right. There's less and less talk about what exactly universal grammar is, and more and more talk about how the ergative case works in some Australian language. So there's much more descriptive studies um, than there were. Um, I'm sure Chomsky himself. And he is, he will be in one week, 93 years old, living in Arizona now, which just seems such a weird place for Chomsky to live. But he's 93, he can live where he wants. (laughs) And um, I'm sure Chomsky would say his views have not changed. But uh, in fact, if you look at the average work in generative grammar, there's much less interest in broad claims about universal grammar and much more detailed descriptive analysis. Okay, thank you. And uh, what's your prediction about the future of linguistics? I mean, that which approach is going to be overwhelming the field and uh, is there any kind of balance between approaches? Do you have any idea about the future of theoretical linguistics? Um, I'm actually very optimistic. Um, I see more and more, more in phonology than in syntax, but increasingly in syntax, uh, people that have been called formal and people who have become called functional are working together. Yeah. Uh, That, uh, I mean, the Prague School always said that there is no contradiction between formal and functional linguistics. I've always said that personally. Um, And what we see now is experimental work that presumes uh, certain constructs from formal linguistics and some from functional linguistics. The boundary is not nearly as sharp as it used to be. Um, There are certain functional linguists like, well, Sandra Thompson or maybe Martin Hospelmatt, I don't know, who would, you know, don't pay much attention to anything done in formal linguistics. But there's more and more, I mean, MIT now has a course on formal and functional linguistics, which is something that never would have happened 20 years ago. So I see formal linguistics, functional linguistics, and experimental work all coming together. I don't have a prediction about what the final product will look like. But I am optimistic that there is a lot more working together than there used to be. 
And what about cognitive linguistics? Is there a kind of revival and what do you think about cognitive linguistics could be claimed to be overwhelming or not? They also remain well, on sideline. I, it depends what you mean by cognitive linguistics. For some people, cognitive linguistics and functional linguistics are basically the same thing. For others, it's cognitive linguistics is some theory that says there's no autonomous syntax, everything is on the surface, that form and meaning are just really this close. I, I don't believe that. Um, I think there are people who say they're doing both cognitive and functional linguistics. Uh, but to me, a lot of cognitive linguistics is very, very descriptive. And I don't mean that in a positive way. I mean that it's a, well, here's a construction, look what it means. Now I'm being over, I'm being uncharitable. I mean, it's more than that, but I think a lot of cognitive linguistics um, doesn't go very deeply. Um, I think that there are concepts from cognitive linguistics that have been used by functional linguistics for a long time, figure and ground, or topic and comment or perspective and so on that have to be built into a linguistic theory. Um, but a lot of the work that I, that to me is just labeled cognitive linguistics, I don't find very interesting because it's just a very descriptive account of what different constructions mean. I could say the same thing about a lot of construction grammar. Okay, all right, so that's what that construction means. Okay, now what? Uh, so just my, my prejudice, I suppose. Thank you so much. If there is, you have questions. Yeah, well, that's a follow-up to that, because that's also a follow-up to what uh, you were, we were talking about before, what you, uh, my previous question with you answered. But I have this, again, this feeling that uh, functional linguists and cognitive linguists, uh, they are descriptive, but they are descriptive not to the same depth. I'm, I'm trying to if you want to see a description of a language, let's say looking at the difference between narrow and wide scope, or looking at how reflexives are bound within, uh, if they're bound locally, or um, uh, long distance binding of reflexives. Uh, I even wonder, is this, somehow you usually see generative grammarians talking about this. You usually don't yes. see functionalists talking about that. Is it because they lack the tools, or is it because they lack the interest, or is it because, uh, I mean, it's it's we. You could imagine doing a complete grammar of a language without referring to and without actually having any of the theoretical baggage of generativism, but still use describing all the facts that generativists address. It seems to me that many of these facts are only being addressed by generativists, and as if uh, no one else seems to care. Is that is that uh, just also just a prejudiced part, or is it is that the way it is? No, I think you're right, and I think there's a reason for that. Many functional and cognitive linguists don't believe in structure. Now, when I say that, of course they say, oh, I believe. They don't believe in structure, detailed, elaborate structure the way it comes out of generative grammar. And I don't think that you can explain complex things like anaphore binding um, or long distance dependencies and so on without a very clear idea of grammatical structure. And people, yeah. they've tried to do that. Uh, Karen Van Hook wrote a book on anaphora from a purely cognitive point, linguistics point of view with no structural constraints. And I just don't think it was very successful because a lot of the most interesting facts about language depend on structure, mm -hmm. on, on, on elaborate structure. And you can't explain what's going on just by talking about meaning, just by talking about speaker perspective or empathy or a lot of the things that cognitive linguists talk about. Okay, just a quick follow-up then, because you can't explain it. But one, does that mean that they can't actually describe it or are they only interested in describing what they can explain? Because theoretically, one could imagine just describing the empirical facts which see which are available, even if you don't 
buy into the actual theory that structure is there. It's still, there's still the, the fact that a reflexive in Icelandic can refer to the subject of a subordinate clause or of the sub subject of a main clause. The same does not hold in English. That must be a fact which is available to anybody regardless of background. But some people don't seem to... Well, uh, is it because they can't explain it, basically? Right, because once you make what you just that descriptive generalization what that you just gave once you start making it more precise you come immediately to the necessity to characterize for icelandic for example to characterize the precise structures of icelandic how they differ from the structures of english how they differ from the structures of korean where there's something similar but different happening and so, um, yes, uh, cognitive and functional linguists have observed many of these things, but they just, they can't go far enough because of the limitations of their ontology, in my opinion. Thank you very much. So thank you so much. If uh, there is no more question, we could finish it but by your words. And if you wish to say something, anything, and I also thank uh, Arthur Holmer and Mikhail Roll for making possible to this webinar to be held at uh, Lund University. It was a very great opportunity to see you online after reading your books. But if you have anything to say, we will hear and then we could. Well, I mean, the main thing I want to say right now is thank you. Um, I really appreciate um, this. How many? kilometers is lens from vancouver seven eight nine more than that and here i am in vancouver uh we're having this talk and uh i never could have made it in person so thank you very much for uh making this exchange possible and i learned a lot from your questions and has me thinking about many things so thank you again thank you so much thank you thank you Okay, thank you. Have a nice day and bye. See you. Uh, thank you, Mehdi, for arranging everything because yes, you actually were the one who arranged this. Yes. Okay. Goodbye. Professor. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you again. Bye bye. Thanks.